lovely to see you. You're you're over in sunny LA, are you at the moment? It's not sunny at no. all. It's it's been it's been the weather the weather since the turn of the new year. The weather's been absolutely like really bad. I don't know what LA's done to the world, but it's 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 been intermittent. So it's like, like one day it's hot and then three days of rain right. and then then it's really grey at the moment. So it's, 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 you know you're in a bad place when London's hot. Well, I was going to say, because very unusually, <laughs> I can say that Hertfordshire is really, we're in the middle yeah. of a heat wave, so I don't want to rub it in, but it's very nice. <laughs> I'll take it for now, I'll take it for now. But yeah, hopefully, I mean, from I think from tomorrow it should be brightened up, so... No, oh, we'll fingers see. crossed. Fingers crossed. So before we talk to you about what you're doing in LA, because that's exciting, um, most people obviously know you for being a finalist on Britain's Got Talent back in 2019. Mm -hmm. And you yep. were Simon's golden buzzer. What was that moment like for you when you got that golden buzzer? It was um it was a uh, it was kind of like a, a risk at, at the time because when I went on the show, it was um it was kind of like I'd done other bits and pieces in the industry before. Yeah. I just became a dad, you know, um, and then it was kind of, um, it was kind of um, doing something that I was afraid of, you know. With comedy, you just want to go and perform and um, and do what you do, but that like, you're putting yourself out to be judged by yeah. some individuals. So it was kind of like a little bit of a different avenue for me. It was kind of. Um, ecstatic really um, I think I wasn't ever unsure of whether I was going to make the crowd laugh or not but because I was um, in the green room with all these other contestants and everyone was talking about oh, how much they wanted Simon's buzzer and all the other stuff and I, 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 when I got it it was actually day one of filming so was normally it? it's quite a surprise yeah it was it was quite a surprise that he'd given it away so early but, but so when I got it it was kind of like a bonus to um, you know, losing some of the fear of putting yeah. myself out there, and you, then um, and then you fell to the with floor, his didn't you? You fell to the floor when the gold I button. did. Do you know? Yeah, because because like you know, the moment for me it was like lit, I was literally going through it. Like I probably had about ten pound in my bank account that day. Like it was like I, you know, I was thinking about so many things about oh. what jokes I was going to do. Then it was how how am I going to take me and my family to the show and back. Yeah, you know, everything like goes was, through your mind. Was, yeah, everything. And it was just like, you know, I just came out here to kind of give myself um, a better opportunity and um, and and then to go and get the buzzer as well was just kind of like insane, absolutely insane. And Simon, who doesn't even... Because when I was performing, I wasn't even performing to Simon. Like, he, I kind of ignored him because yeah. I knew he didn't really like comedians and all the other stuff. Because obviously you got to do research before you go on there. So I just like, you know, if I get three likes, um, I, if I get three yeses from the other judges, then I get three. Yeah. That's all I was focused on. Simon did that, it blew my mind. Well, he did his usual, didn't he? I don't like comedians on the show. Then, a, then he paused and he said, but I love you. So <laughs> Yeah, when he was doing that, I was like, mate, no on national television, sir. No, no. My family won't even, they told me to get on the DLR by myself. So I was like, <laughs> mate. I can't, I can't have that. Um, but so when he did that, I was like, wow, like it blew my mind. So I was so grateful. Oh, and so, so from then you've gone from strength to strength. I mean, you already were quite successful, weren't you? you for years you'd been on the um, comedy circuit doing so opening for different um, yeah. of the top comedians in the, in the, in the world. Um, but a lot of people don't realise that you actually came from a fostering background. So it's been quite a difficult journey for you. Yeah, so um, I got, I went into foster care from like the age of five. When the foster care, me and my sister Anita, um, I was five, she was three years old. Um, and we, 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 got, we got moved into the foster system. Our parents got arrested. Mm -hmm. um, and we were uh, actually living in Islington at the time. But um, Sandra, who... Um, we, we got taken into she was living in Hackney but she was working for um, Islington Borough so um, so we got moved in there when it was five and um, you got moved together was, yes Both got moved together there's a lot of siblings yeah. are split aren't they yes yeah. exactly exactly so they, so so they kept me and my sister together mm -hmm. uh, initially it was supposed to be I think for 
three months until they found somewhere um, permanent for us. But from from the day we moved there till I was about eighteen, I think we never we, we never moved. We, oh, we stayed. You had a- we, yeah, we stayed with Sandra and possibly had the best childhood that any any children could ever have. And oh, we beautiful. she had three children of her own um over the over that period and other kids would come in and go. They were coming in yeah. and out, but we was always the mainstay. And when you when you're when that's happening, you don't understand how blessed you are. You don't understand that most kids in the system aren't aren't yeah. having this consistency. You know, they're being moved around to all different houses and you know the thought of really liking somewhere and then moving to a house that isn't as great. Do you know what I mean? It's like those were things that we never really had to concern ourselves mm-hmm. with. I think there was a little period where when our parents were released and deported back to Ghana, we um yeah, we got sent back to Ghana for like a, a year and a half. And then my mom was like, Yeah, you know, they've come out here, but I think it's best for them to kind of be in England. So then we got sent back to my Aunt Sandra. Oh um, that's, that's what we lucky call it. You went back. Yeah. You managed to go back well, to Sandra. the thing is, I mean, my mum pulled a faster because she didn't even tell Sandra he was coming back. <laughs> so so literally, she just sent us back and said that she knows that she would take us in. So mm-hmm. I came, and then a month later, Anita came unannounced as well. And then, but my aunt loved us so much that it was kind of like a no-brainer. And thank God yeah. she had the space for us. Oh, so, I mean, going back to when you first went to Sandra's, you were very young, but can you remember that yeah. time? I remember it like it was an hour ago. Like, yeah. like it was literally just us. We came in there, and um, at first, at first we, I was, I was kind of not really sure what was going on. I thought we was going to visit someone, right? Like yeah. Our, our um, social media was taking us somewhere, and we, we got there. Me and Anita, and me is obviously still a baby, and I'm, I'm kind of like sitting there and I, but the thing is when I saw Sandra like the first time I ever saw it it's just weird it was very weird it was just like I was I was happy when I saw her I had like a whole energy yeah it was amazing she was so warm you know and and all the other kids were really cool during all this time when you were with Sandra you still were in touch with your birth family your birth parents yeah. were you yeah so we that- we'd, we'd go and visit them yeah we'd go and visit them when I think about it now, it would probably be like once a month, maybe we go and visit them. And I remember my mum was really good at drawing. So she was she would like every time we go and see her, we'd come back with a poster of our superhero. Do you know what I mean? So <laughs> oh my bed my bedroom was covered with like Superman and Spider-Man and all the other stuff. And then my dad gave us nothing. <laughs> so he just got a hug from him. That was um that that was it. That was it really. So um so yeah, so it was kind of good to kind of still have that. Um, idea of who they were and and, yeah. um, and go and see them, do you know what I mean? And just keep them updated. Um, and we'd always look forward to that, but we'd always, it, we'd be having so much fun where we were that it wasn't like we missed them. No, it's lovely that you and you had two, you've had two families in the end in a, in a yeah. difficult situation. It's actually work, worked out really well for you. And you're still in touch with Sandra now, aren't you? You still see? Um, every day. Yeah. Oh. Every day. Like that's probably the closest woman in my life, to be honest. Um, and she's she's helped me through a lot. See, like raised me practically. I'm I'm a lot like her as well. Um, so so yeah, that's like the the, the I call her my lifesaver because you know you again you don't know how blessed you are because other kids didn't have it like we did. No, no, and at the moment across the UK. And and in Hertfordshire, we are really urgently looking for foster carers. There's really small numbers now, and there are so many children in Hertfordshire alone. We have a thousand children in care, most of them wanting foster families, um, and and we just need people to come forward. What would you say to people to encourage if anyone's thinking about it? Because it's not something you can just do straight away. But if yeah. you're thinking about fostering, what would you say? to maybe persuade them what what did it mean to you um i think the see my my only issue with fostering from the uh from the bar from the social services kind of side is i i, I don't really like the idea of short term no 
You know, for me, it's it's the biggest. It's 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 a hindrance to children, if if I'm honest, because I feel like it should either be long term and then they go back to their parents, um, and and well, short term and then they go back to their actual parents, yeah. or, or 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 raise that child. You know, and and if there's any special circumstances where you can no longer no, no longer do that. Um, then, then it's understandable for them to move on to another place. But the child is being put into an environment where they don't really know how long they're going to be there. Why commit to um, the family if, you, if you're going to be moved on after a certain yeah. amount of time? It's, it's very, very damaging. Um, and I think it adds to the stereotype of what, what, what foster children go through. And the worst thing is to be in an amazing home. The worst thing is to be in an amazing home and have to leave. And I never ever had to experience that, and because we had the consistency um, of of a family that that took us in all the way, basically into our like you know sixteen or whatever to get to be independent, that that consistency. And I think if people um to encourage like people to um foster, I think it's um it's sort of like the best sort of commitment you can give to a child that isn't yours. You know, and understanding that that more than being raised by your own parents, uh, every child needs consistency. So if so if 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 they're not going to be with their parents and that's their consistency, then that's fine for them because at least they have a rhythm somewhere else. And I think it's about rhythm with children. And I think when people are thinking about fostering, I think your 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 life savings. You know, even more than adopting the child, like you're genuinely a life saver because your adoption is claiming that child as your own and going all the way, understandably. But but fostering is getting someone prepared for the world, getting somebody prepared to go back to maybe their parents, you know, giving them an environment, getting them involved in youth clubs and scouts and clubs and camping trips and and, and all of the things that we, me and Anita experienced. We knew from a very young age how big the world was because... I hate to say what my life would have been like had I been with my parents, you know, and what I've learned through the process is sometimes because people become fathers and mothers don't mean that they're the best people for their children. And, and if you've got the space and the heart to um, to add to a child's life and give them a better surrounding, um, I think I think it's a job that you should step up and do. There's people that can't have children. There are people who... Um, maybe would like to experience what that commitment is like before they have children. I think I think there's so many children that need consistency and they need a home and, and love ultimately. And I think I, I, I definitely um, tell people like so many benefits of helping that. Um, one of the reasons why I'm out in LA at the moment is I'm creating a, a sitcom um, that I've written, which is about, um, it's about um, fostering. And it's about me and my uh, my sister's journey, because because I understand that to in order my my whole campaign is to get more people to foster through through the show. But I think the best way sometimes to do that is through laughter, through entertainment, through um, scenarios, dramatic scenarios that people can kind of digest. You know, when I was young, I used to watch things like The Cosby Show and The Fresh Prince of Bel Air and yeah. all these types of shows, and it made me want to be part of those families. It made me. Um, when I go to think about going to college, it made me think about all of these things because I saw the kids in that family doing it. And I think for, to have a show that's um, um, got a foster family and kids going into foster care really can show um, other people who haven't stepped up yet and um, what that journey can really, really be like with consistency. Oh, that's, that's incredible. Every- it's so exciting. So when... Where are you? What stage are you at with the sitcom? Well, we're, we're at we're at the stage of um um just negotiating at the moment. We've written a pilot. Um, it's been received really well. Um, so we just and um, there's a writer strike out here at the moment, but we're still talking to like production companies in in the UK and stuff like that. But but, but I mean, like, I've written my autobiography. So I know I've got a list um, of things that you're doing. You are <laughs> <so> busy. <laughs> So, so I've got a lot because I really this is the this is the passion project. This is the thing that I want to do more than anything else in the world because I, I feel so blessed to have gone on that journey. And even some of my friends, um, um, my, my roommate out here in LA, he's he he's gone through the foster system as well. Yeah. So we've we there's a lot of friends out there. Jimmy Akambola, you know, he's just done a docu- yeah. documentary yeah. fostering. Jimmy's yeah. a friend of mine out here, and you know, there's a lot of us that have. Gone through, there's so many celebrities that have probably gone through the same thing that haven't 
um, even spoken about it, you know? So for us, yeah. there's like a nice pool of people who want that message out there. And I'm yeah. just trying to get it out there in a beautiful way that would um, highlight um, the fun of raising children. Oh, that's it. And you've got the platform to do that on. So, I mean, it's just amazing that you're, you're going forward with that. Um, with the whole comedy thing, I was just wondering, during your fo- the time that you were fostered, did you always want to be a comedian? Did Sandra help? push you in that direction or did you develop that later? I was um I was you know my aunt always had funny friends she'd had funny she had funny friends that would come over like from church and and we'd entertain her we'd have a right good old laugh we'd go on trips to like Blackpool we'd hire a coach and <laughs> and the whole family our friends would all go to Blackpool for this so we, we did a lot of things like that and it was always laughter always laughter and then um and my aunt Joan he was a good friend of my aunt. She um, she really kind of rem- let me know that it was okay to kind of like be a Christian, but also to have sense of humor as well. Yeah, and that was kind of safe in it because I never wanted to be kind of be disrespectful or anything like that when I was stand up. But she really kind of let me know because she was very she was she was a pastor, my aunt Joan, but she was also very very funny, very witty, very quick. Yeah. I admired that about her. When I was young, I didn't really know what comedy was I just knew I could make people laugh in school the football team in at home when people came around so it was more like when I came I did a project called Camp America and Camp America was where you get to go to America for like two months work with young people out there oh um, yeah yeah I, I yeah did, yeah did that twice I did that two years in a row and they loved me absolutely loved me the kids were great and then on the weekend, I found out about stand-up comedy when I saw Martin Lawrence performing on a on a DVD or something. And then I fell in love with that. I said, "That's what I want to do. That's that's what I want to do." But until then, it was all football, all football. I played football, um, various teams, trials, training, all of that. And then, um, I instead of going to like, I got into like this um, school of excellence, and then I, uh, I, I went to the carnival, and I didn't go to the game. Oh. I went to Notting Hill Carnival with my mates. <laughs> I, but I feel like, you know, even in my book, I'd say that's the moment my life changed and went down another direction yeah. because although I loved football, I didn't have the discipline, you know? And and, and I think the lack of discipline and seeing my dream kind of fade away um, really uh, made sure that the next opportunity I got in, no matter what field it was, I was going to work harder than everyone yeah. else and I was going to make sure. And then I think that was the moment where God kind of shifted me into my right ball direction because yeah. comedy is what I was born to do I think anyone who's ever played football with me went to school with me youth clubs they're all when they found out I do stand up it just went smoothly yeah. not you know, surprising they, yeah everybody understood exactly what I was like when I was a kid and now you know it's it's um something that I love to do I love to make people feel good make people forget about what they're going through mm-hmm. and I really kind of showed that we're all the same and in, in, yeah. in a certain degree you did you did a tour last year didn't you in the uk and then have you got something coming up this year a special show in london that you're working yes yeah, so, so basically um i i toured in 2020 so it was kind of beginning of the pandemic oh right yeah so, so it was like february between february and march and then we couldn't we couldn't do the, the last three That's days of the show. Timing, was it just after BGT? Oh. You get the pandemic the next year, <laughs> mate. Like we, we we have thirty dates and we've done twenty seven. So we have the, the the last three. The big show was going to be at Hackney Empire, my local oh. theatre, and then and then we didn't get to do it. So so um so that was kind of tough to kind of be on a trajectory and then everything. The world just shut down for two years. You know what I mean? But. In that time, I got to finish the book. I got to write new material. I got to engage with like people online in different ways and have different brands and stuff. And then, um, and then now it's kind of like I'm working out here in LA, working on the comedy circuit out here. Got really good team agents and stuff. My managers are great as well, and we are just creating them. I've done a lot of work with Chappelle, with Dave Chappelle, over the last couple yeah. of years. And so he's kind of in my corner as well, and then um. 20 years ago, I started a comedy night in central London that a lot of people came through. That's where I met Dave Chappelle, Chris Rock, and people like that, Kevin Hart. And um, we're doing um, the Roundhouse Comedy Festival in August in Camden, and we're celebrating yeah. the years of the comedy. So, so that's what we're looking forward to. And then next year, I'm going to be working on that, my new um, Netflix hour. 
Wow, you're you're so so busy. It's just it's amazing hearing everything that you've done in your life and the fostering side of things that you're going to be pushing out with a, a sitcom to to share your story. It's just amazing, and we really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Good luck with the sitcom. Good luck with your autobiography. Yeah. Good luck with your show. Good luck with you. <laughs> just... No, definitely. I think I think um I think it's going to be good because obviously um whenever anything comes up with fostering, I'm 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 all over it because. It's something that a lot of people still don't know about me, you know. And my new my new hour is all about my real life, my parents, and my. Cause you know, I lost my mum. I lost my mum in um, August. Oh no! And then she passed. Away. Yeah. So, so my mum, my mum, my mum passed away in August. We had her funeral in January. So that kind of like really kind of cemented her absence in in my in my head in terms of because I found out what she was doing in my in the absence and she was helping all these other young people that needed yeah. me and what I realized at her memorial was as children you want your parents but sometimes you may not need them because where we were we were loved we were we were we were happy we was enjoying our lives and growing nicely but there was kids that needed my mom do you know what I mean and she went and served those people and to hear the stories of how she impacted their lives even though she was absent in ours was so fulfilling for me. And it comes back to the fostering thing of, we're born with the responsibilities, but our responsibility is to make sure that our kids are safe wherever they are. But purpose sometimes is not your own children, it's other people's kids who yeah. may not have their parents there. And my mom served a lot of young people. So to hear those stories kind of brought everything round in my head yeah. to kind of- Full circle. Really appreciate- Yeah. Well, yeah, he, he really appreciate her life more. And thank her for everything that she 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 left us with, you know. So, oh, oh. well, so so lovely to talk to you, Kojo. Thank you so much. Always, always, man. Go and enjoy the grey weather in LA, and I'll go out into the sunshine in <laughs> <laughs> I'll try my best. But yeah, I'll catch up with you soon, Lee. Yeah, take much, care. Man. Bye. All right, bye, bye.